He shrugged his shoulders and turned off the stairs into the corridor and walked softly to the door of his room. Bond knew exactly where the switch was, and it was with one flow of motion that he stood on the threshold with the door full open, the light on, and a gun in his hand. The safe, empty room sneered at him. He ignored the half-open door of the bathroom, and, locking himself in, he turned up the bed light and the mirror light, and threw his gun on the settee beside the window. Then he bent down and inspected one of his own black hairs, which still lay undisturbed where he had left it before dinner, wedged into the drawer of the writing desk. Next, he examined a faint trace of talcum powder on the inner rim of the porcelain handle of the clothes cupboard. It appeared immaculate. He went into the bathroom, lifted the cover of the lavatory system, and verified the level of the water against a small scratch on the copper ballcock. Doing all this, inspecting these minute burglar alarms, did not make him feel foolish or self-conscious. He was a secret agent, and still alive thanks to his exact attention to the detail of his profession. Routine precautions were to him no more unreasonable than they would be to a deep-sea diver or a test pilot, or to any man earning danger money. Who are you? Bond. James Bond. I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. A relic of the Cold War. Shaken, but not stirred. 007 reporting for duty. These are the 00 Files. Welcome to the podcast of the 00 Files. My name is Dom and we are about to do something new and exciting. We're going to go through the first James Bond novel written by Ian Fleming, which is, of course, Casino Royale, which was first published by Jonathan Cape all the way back in 1953. I'm recording this podcast with my partner from the Deuxième Bureau in France, who knocked on my door and tried to sell me a record player. It's Tyler! How are you doing, Tyler? Bonjour, Don. Ça va bien? Et toi? Oh, I'm so glad we're not going to do this in French. Exactly, me too. I'm doing <laughs> great. How are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you. This is the first time that we're actually recording via Skype. So it's a first and uh, let's see how this goes. By the way, if you didn't get that reference about the Dojum Bureau, don't worry. We're going to explain everything in this podcast. We've been meaning to create this podcast for a very long time now, and we also kept postponing it due to all kinds of circumstances. But the main reason was is that we just want to do this right. And that takes a lot of time preparing and reading up on all the background information and creating a narrative and collecting resources, all that stuff. But now we finally started and we're going to delve into Casino Royale. Are you excited? I am. Yeah. Love yeah. this book. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful book. So let me explain to the listeners how we want to do this. Rather than giving a broad overview of the entire book, we really like to go deep on it. And we want to delve into all the little details and take our time with the book. So we decided to divide the book into three sections. And we're going to record three separate podcasts, one on each section. And that basically means that for this podcast, we're only going to go through chapters one till nine. And uh, we don't know exactly how long that will take. It's the first, so we'll, you know, we'll find out. Now, before we begin looking at Casino Royale, let's first create a bit of context. This book was written in 1952 and published in 1953. It's a long time ago. The story is set in the summer of 1951. And we know this because Fleming even mentions it all the way in Goldfinger, that it's set in June 51. Uh, and Goldfinger Bond meets a character uh, from Casino Royale, and he recalls, oh, I remember you from France, 51, in Royale Les Eaux. What do you know about this period, Tyler? Well, it was just after the Second World War, of course, so people in England and in Britain and in Europe uh, were still gathering their stuff and their thoughts about after, after the war. Um, I believe food was even on stamps still in Britain, so... Is this also the period of the baby boomers? Or is that earlier even, after the war? Well, it, it started in, in 1945 and went on to until 55, I guess. About a decade. People yeah. were very happy, so a lot of kid, kids were born uh, nine months after that. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, It's also the period that my parents were born. Uh, my mom was born in 53, my dad in 54. So we know a bit about this period, but at the same time, it's a long way back in the past. Yeah, true. 
sure. So it's you have to realize that it's difficult to to realize what the world was like at that time, especially with the Cold War starting slowly, yeah. the technology changing rapidly. It's, it's kind of difficult to just to imagine what it was, what it was yeah, like. Yeah, and of course, so, a lot of separation between classes in Britain, for instance, you really had to, you still had the upper class and and the, the the lower and the middle classes, which nowadays is a bit more interwoven. Mm. So, would you consider Fleming to be upper class? I'm not sure because he's the second son in the in the family and usually in England you only the first son of the family gets the estate and all the all, all the money from the, the family. privileges. Yeah, exactly. So so mm. Fleming was a I believe he was the second son so he he really worked himself up in the world but of course he he was born with a bit of a silver spoon in his mouth. Uh, I believe it was either his father or his, his grandfather that started a bank and they definitely had plenty of money, the Flemings. But I'm sure that in in the future we'll do a, a podcast or a special episode on Fleming uh, himself. In preparation of this book, I, I also uh, read reread a part of the book Goldeneye, where Bond was born, Ian Fleming's Jamaica. Do you know that book? Um, I haven't read it yet. It's on my uh, on my Audible wish list to to listen to it uh, sometime soon. Yeah, I'll put it high on the list. Uh, yeah, I'll probably need book. it. Yeah. <laughs> It's uh, written by historian Matthew Parker, and he published it in uh, 2015. I found it a fascinating read, and, and Parker provides a very distinct context of the times when Fleming was writing his books. Basically, it's a world and a time I know virtually nothing about. But um, in preparation, I created a few audio clips from the audiobook version of, of GoldenEye, and I want to play the first one, and then we can uh, see what we think about that. So I'm going to play it right now. Here we go. Fleming's trip to Jamaica at the beginning of 1952 was the pivotal moment of his life. By the time he left in late March, he was both an author and a married man. Much had changed since the previous visit in October 1951. Esmond Rothermere and Anne had agreed to a divorce, and by January, Anne knew she was pregnant again. Although many of his friends advised against it, Ian had decided this time to do the right thing and marry her. The wedding was to be in Jamaica, the easiest way, according to Anne, just as soon as the divorce papers came through. But Fleming, the sleek bachelor of 44 years of age, was worried by the marriage, or this dangerous transmogrification, as he put it. Would his difficulties, he wrote to Anne, still be tolerated when she was no longer in love with him, but instead settled into the usual married friendship? You might get too irritated, I don't know, he wondered. On the 7th of February, Anne's divorce was finalised, and she and Ian could start planning their wedding, now set for the end of March. Okay, Tyler, what do you think the of that? The usual marital friendship. I love that line. <laughs> it's like, okay, all bets are off. We, well, we ended up together, and, well, we'd better make the best of it. So <laughs> let's see if you can still put up with me uh, when, when, the love is, uh, when the love is over. Yeah, um, it was... Fleming was like the eternal bachelor. But and... it sounds very cynical to me. Yeah. It's like, well, yeah, let's, let's do the right thing. And then hopefully after a year or two, you, you still like me enough to be able to live around me. Or... Yeah, I'm glad I don't, I'm not in a similar kind of relationship um, to begin with. It, when I listen to this, I find it so hard to relate to that. Like you said, Fleming... He looks at the world differently, I think. I don't know if that's because this all happened 60-odd uh, years ago or because he was British or because he was uh, a wealthy man. I have no idea. But, yeah, it's it's different. It's different, but yeah. Looking ahead to the book we're, we're about to cover, it sounds a lot like the way Bond reacts to, to hearing that, that Vesper Lind will be his, uh, his, uh, his second in command during this mission. It has that same undertone. Well... Yeah, if we start going through the chapters, there are multiple times when you can maybe read between the lines what Fleming thinks of women and how uh, what what their position should be mm. uh, along the men. You wanna you wanna listen to the second clip also from uh, the book Golden Eye. It basically describes how Fleming started this whole project because I think he was just uh, one, well, trying to have a bit of fun and two, trying to escape his own life. Let's listen Let's to that, okay? As the wedding loomed and without the distraction of guests, Anne noted that it was 
rather a tense period in our lives. She had become enthused by her painting, but Ian seemed at a loose end. According to Anne, she suggested that he should write something just to amuse himself. And so, in the same undated diary fragment that tells of the Milk River trip, we find the following from Anne. This morning, Ian started to type a book. Very good thing. He says he cannot be idle while I screw up my face trying to draw fish. Perhaps Anne takes too much credit. Ian had packed his twenty-year-old imperial portable typewriter, and on passing through New York ten days earlier, had purchased a ream of best-quality folio writing paper from a shop on Madison Avenue. The intention to write was already there. On around the 17th of February, he sat down at his desk in Goldeneye's main room, plucked a name from the author of Birds of the West Indies, whose book sat on his shelf, lined up his ream of smart paper, and started to write. So began Bond, with the claustrophobic first line of Casino Royale. The scent and smoke and sweat of a casino are nauseating at three in the morning. When later asked what inspired him to create James Bond, Fleming's stock answer, much to the annoyance of Anne, was that he started writing to take his mind off the hideous spectre of matrimony. In fact, that was only part of a wider crisis for Ian that included concerns about money, his health, and the state of his country and empire. All right. Well, the the state of his health and the state of the empire. <laughs> uh, it sounded like he really just needed something to do, really. But I don't know what you make of it. Yeah, I'll probably return to this often. But but it sounds so cynical. Well, well she is busying herself with her painting. Um, he, he starts writing just to get his mind off things. I... Well, it, it, like you said, it sounds like a, like a different world and a different way of, of communicating with each other. I find it funny that Anne, in her mind, sets Ian's mind to start writing. But it's very clear that Fleming has always had the intention of writing this book. I mean, he's been toying with this idea for a long, long time. And it's also known that he was saying that he wanted to basically write the spy thriller to end all spy thrillers. Um, so it's not something that he just, it, it didn't just came out of the blue, like, uh, I'm going to write a story. Did he buy the gold-plated typewriter before or after? No, okay. not yet, okay. not yet. Not, no, no, that, that comes later. But that, that might come up in a future mm. podcast or something. We'll but see, we'll see. that first line of the novel, what a great way to start your writing career. Uh, it, I love that line. Uh, where do I have it? The scent and smoke and sweat of a casino are nauseating at three in the morning. Yeah. I don't want to be there. <laughs> that sounds no, horrible. No, but, but still, it, it sets the tone for the rest of the novel. And I, I really love that line. It's it's a great start. <laughs> yeah. Um, Charlie Hickson used uh, a variation uh, of it on in his first novel, Silverfin, something like the scent of sweat uh, in a dormitory yeah, that's is true. Yeah, nauseating or something like I don't know. I don't remember it properly, but yeah, he used that. It's, it's very famous. Um, I have a third and final audio clip from this book, Goldeneye, and it describes something of the writing process of Ian Fleming. I find it very helpful whenever I try to write anything, really. So let's uh, play that third clip. It all came out very fast, poured onto the page. Anne later commented that Ian wasn't very anxious to start, but once he'd begun, of course, he found himself enjoying it, and he finished the book in a great burst of enthusiasm. This first novel was finished at the latest on the 18th of March, possibly even earlier, which meant an average of more than 2,000 words a day. Out of reach of the delicious cooling sea breeze, it must have become very hot inside shuttered Goldeneye. But the prospect of a refreshing dip in the bay would have been a great reward for a target reached. Just another thousand words! Fleming later declared that the main thing is to write fast and cursively in order to get narrative speed. It was fatal to start criticising what you had just written, he advised. Instead, you just had to keep going. Awful bits could always be corrected later. In fact, the manuscript of Casino Royale shows more subsequent changes than any other of his books. Almost all the Bond books would be written at a similar rate, and sometimes it shows. For Casino Royale, however, Fleming clearly had key scenes well thought out before he sat down in front of his typewriter. Okay, just start writing and just go on and on and on and on. Yep. That's it. And I believe it's it's Raymond Benson in his Bad Sound Companion who, who elaborates a bit more on his uh, on Fleming's writing process. Mm. He uh, he would start a day with a the hearty breakfast and then 
ride a couple of hours, then go out for, for some swimming or, or some snorkeling, and ride a couple more hours. Don't read what you've written until you're done with the entire book, and then you'd start to start the editing process. It's tough work, man. It's like a month. Yeah, but he only took a month. If you, if you look at the um, uh, the man with the golden gun, which was probably just his earliest draft uh, that was published, mm -hmm. um, you can see how much time and effort he spent into that phase afterwards, after the writing process. By yeah, way. true. Yeah, with 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 some embellishments and and uh, elaborating on the topics he's describing, a lot of work went into that as well. I think that's true because he finished this somewhere in March fifty two. And then it was a whole year before it was finally published. That's also because he didn't want to do anything with it for a long time, but also because he was still fine-tuning it and correcting uh, stuff. Yeah, I think it's just fascinating. My my wife is now um, doing a master's studies and she has to write um, all sorts of papers and articles, but it's really struggling. And then when you find someone who is has such an easy job on the on the outside of things writing a story constructing it i think it's uh, fascinating any other thoughts from goldeneye or you want to move uh, on no it's like i said it's really a book that i should read because i think it's a, it has it gives a nice insight into the man's life it does and what it also did is it kind of explains a lot about British history and it, the way it affects Jamaica and the British Empire and also how that influences Fleming's view of the world and how that again in its turn influences the way he writes and what James Bond does. Mm -hmm. So it's really a good read and to go through it multiple times. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to put in a few clips every now and then in these podcasts from the book. And then by the end of our project, you'll have listened to <laughs> the entire thing, probably. <laughs> now, I want to listen to one last um, uh, clip before we actually uh, start with the book. And that's from an interview I found on YouTube. It's an old interview with Ian Fleming. It's probably yeah. very famous, but we just have to put it in here. It's an interview by uh, Munro Scott, and it was recorded in 64, apparently only a few months before Fleming's death. And it was originally filmed for a Canadian TV station. And in this interview, Fleming describes how he came upon the name of James Bond. So now let's finally listen to the man himself. Mr. Fleming, how does an author tackle the problem of selecting a name for the hero of his stories? Well, it isn't only the hero. I mean, I generally pick up names just driving through the countryside, I, through villages and so on. You'll see an interesting name. Uh, over a tobacconist or chemist or something of that sort in any country in the world. But um, when I started to write these books in 1952, I wanted to find um, a name which wouldn't have any of this uh, romantic uh, overtones like Peregrine Carruthers or whoever it might be. I wanted a really flat, quiet name. And one of my Bibles out here is uh, James Bond's Birds of the West Indies, which is a very famous uh, ornithological book indeed. And I thought, well, now, James Bond, now, that's a pretty quiet name. And so I simply stole it and used it. Well, do you think that if we had a hero called Peregrine Carruthers, it would have been a, a, a success like uh, James um, Bond? <laughs> well, his introduction would have been a lot more difficult than it is now. <laughs> but it's funny how a dull and quiet name like James Bond became probably one of the most yeah. famous names in the world. But it's a yeah. it's a famous interview, yeah. And he really got the, got his name from from things close around him, uh, a book on a shelf. Uh, his his neighbor in in Jamaica was named Goldfinger, I believe. Didn't really like the guy, so made, he he made him a villain in one of his novels. Yeah, like I like that. But it's it's really good because you sit at your desk and you had to start writing. Now, what are you going to call your hero? And I think it's funny that the hero is given a flat, dull name. Um, and it also makes the villains more interesting because they can be uh, very exotic. And they have wonderful names of that, like Scaramanga yeah. or um, Le Chiffre in this novel. I think it's, it's great that he... He has a feeling for that, yeah. Have you ever read that book, Birds of the West Indies? No, I have not, no. I have no interest no. in birds, really, but my son kind of likes it. So I might give this book to him when he's a bit older. I don't know. It's like a collector's item. Probably, yeah. Probably, yeah. So James Bond was this ornithologist, 
And I, I found that this book was written in 36. So it's quite an old book. And I also read, I don't know, it might be from the book Goldeneye, I don't know, but that um, Fleming actually met James Bond, the ornithologist. Mr. and Mrs. Bond uh, visited him in Jamaica. Yeah, exactly. And then Fleming said that whenever James Bond was uh, going to write his own book, he could use the name Ian Fleming if he wanted to. I found that quite funny. Yeah, and Mr. Bond had yeah. a lot of trouble uh, <laughs> at airports and stuff like that, where, where people would be like, oh, are you carrying around any guns, uh, are you, Mr. Bond? <laughs> And still, there are plenty of people, I believe, that are called James Bond, because James is quite a common name, yeah, Mrs. Bond. In the, um, Someone yeah. made a documentary about that. Uh, I believe it was called The Other Fellow or something like that, about people who are who are actually named James Bond. Just, Just normal, normal people, people with the name James Bond. Uh, that's, yeah. that's quite funny. I have to find that documentary. I'd like to see that, yeah. All right, so... We've heard from Fleming himself. We learned a bit about how and why he started writing in the first place. And we heard about the creation of James Bond. Are you ready, Tyler, to actually open the book and start the review of Casino Royale? Absolutely. Okay, let's start at the beginning. We're going to go to chapter one, The Secret Agent. Casino Royale by Ian Fleming. Chapter one, The Secret Agent. The scent and smoke and sweat of a casino are nauseating at three in the morning. Basically, this is the first chapter and we are introduced to James Bond, but we don't know who he is yet. Is he the secret agent from the title chapter? We don't know. It can be anyone. We read that he's in a casino in France, apparently, and he is observing this man, Le Chiffre, who we also know nothing about. And this Le Chiffre is winning at the casino. Now Bond is tired, he decides to leave, and I really like this um, paragraph uh, because he notices the cashier and he thinks how one would try to rob the casino. And whenever you read this for the first time you, and you don't know who James Bond is, you might think that he is like a robber and he wants to rob the casino. You don't know yet. Yeah, he also says something about how you probably can't find two people in France who would be willing to, to kill someone during a robbery. Yeah, about a dozen or something, or ten. It would You would need at least ten good men, but you probably can't find ten good men in France. Let me find the actual sentence. Here I have it. As for rubbing the cast in which Bond himself was not personally concerned, but only interested, he reflected that it would take ten good men, that they would certainly have to kill one or two employees, and that anyway, you probably couldn't find ten non-squill killers in France. Or any other country, for the matter of that. Yeah, how times have changed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so, yeah. What I like about this part is it's written with uh, a lot of insight in how casinos work, how their security works, or used to work. Now, you probably know more about casinos than I do. So, if you read this chapter, does it resemble any of the casinos nowadays, or is this really old-fashioned? I think it's, it, it's pretty old-fashioned. I think uh, Diamonds Are Forever gives quite a good insight in the in the vegas casinos uh, during that time the film or the book no the book there's a okay. chapter in there called i believe it's called the eye in the sky about uh, the camera measures that they that they take well getting in into a casino at least in the netherlands is you need to show your id and then you can walk in and in las vegas it's all a bit more low-key you can just enter the casino without really seeing any security but it's there uh, nonetheless. All right. So in these first few pages, Fleming, to my opinion, he shows off his, his knowledge, his writing style, and I am immediately hooked. I want to know what's going on, who this Bond is. And we learn a bit about James Bond when he fantasizes about the meeting that would take place the next morning. He's being described as an Englishman, uh, someone that plays a progressive system, someone that plays in maximums, that he has luck. His nerves seem good. That's the way he would describe himself. And that tells you a bit about him as a character. And it's not until he leaves the casino, like I just read, that we find out that Bond is not interested in robbing the caisse. But he is afraid that Le Chiffre, whoever that might be, might be interested in doing that. But anyway, Bond is um, nearly home. And the first thing he does is he wants to find out if anybody has searched his room. And then it finally clicks, he is the secret agent. Yeah, and what a great scene that is. It's just with the talcum powder and we see it in, in the movie Doctor No. Exactly, yeah. One-on-one, -on -one, the same scene. 
Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure whether whether uh, Benson coined this ter- term for the first time, but the Fleming sweep that makes you want to read on and on and on and gets you excited for what is coming next. I think it starts right here. It starts in the first chapter of the first book. You're hooked, right? You want to know what's going on. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. you're there's no explanation. You're just inside a casino with a few people and there's some tension but you don't know why exactly you have a lot of a lot of question marks but it, nothing is really explained really the information is slowly being fed to you and you just want to go on and on exactly yeah. we find out that he has extra funding of 10 million francs uh, so apparently he's wealthy as well this this bond character he has sent a cable through paris to his headquarters in london and we read that someone has spoken to M. We have no idea who M is. No. But we find out that Bond is at Royal Zoo. Now, I tried as a kid, well, teenager, after reading this book, I've spent <laughs> hours looking at maps, looking for Royal Zoo. It's not there, is it? <laughs> no. It's a fictional yeah. town. It's a <laughs> fictional town with a fictional spring and fictional mineral water. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's in the north of France somewhere. It's it's supposed to be close to Dieppe, I think. Fleming describes it as only 150 miles across the channel from that deadly office building near Regent's Park, his headquarters. But we find out that this Bond is a loner. He likes to be in charge of the situation. And we get that spycraft, uh, what you mentioned. As soon as he comes into the hotel, he tears off a telegram form. And he's writing on the desk and not on the page below. So he won't give a copy to the hotel of whatever he's writing. Yeah. All these tiny details. I love that. How do you know these things? Well, he's an expert. He's also not really the, the, um, the rookie agent that he's being portrayed as in, uh, as in, uh, the, the movie. No, definitely not. No, he's a very senior agent. He knows exactly what he's doing. Yeah. He writes in code. He doesn't want to take the lift. He want to take the stairs. And he writes to M that the extra funding of 10 million francs should suffice. And then later on, he regrets writing that. Feels a bit cheeky. Like, um, there's no certainty when you're a gambler. No, there's there's nothing worse than having too little money when uh, when going out on a mission like this. Yeah, exactly. Fleming calls it his hubris, which is a Greek term for being overconfident. What I also like is Bond shrugs off his regret. It's like, yeah, it's in the past, you know, can't help it anymore. Shouldn't have done it, but, you know, that's the way it is. Oh, well, I'll make do. Yeah, exactly. What I also like about when he checks his hotel room with the talcum powder and the hair is that Fleming describes to you as a reader that Bond finds these precautions important, yeah. not silly, because that's what keeps you alive. Yeah, exactly. And now already, to my opinion, we see quite a few differences between the literary Bond and the cinematic Bond. Bond because in the films especially nowadays he's not a spy anymore no he's really he's an assassin right an, now an action hero but it, it depends on where what cinematic Bond iteration you're looking at because I think the, the first few Connery movies and, and especially uh, Honor Majesty's Secret Service as well those are pretty close to what Fleming wrote yeah and I can see it also with uh, Timothy Dalton in his films yeah. but that's those are the films that I personally enjoy the most when Bond is being a spy instead of an action hero. But that's my personal preference. I really enjoy a good Roger Moore movie as well. But <laughs> He is the worst spy ever. Probably, probably, yeah, probably. but he's a great <laughs> yeah. fictional character uh, for a movie. Yeah. So the ending of the chapter is when Bond is getting ready for bed. And this is something I would never do. He takes a cold shower which I hate. I would never do that. And he smokes his 70th cigarette of the day. Now, that is a lot. Yes. 70 cigarettes, that is a lot. Yeah. But I'm not a smoker, so I don't know. But it just seems With like... 70 cigarettes lot. a day, you're yeah. not a smoker for long, I think. <laughs> but, well, <laughs> probably. Now, here I did some calculations. I always like to do some calculations. Bond checks his working capital, which is 23 million francs. Or Fleming explains to the audience that it's 23,000 pounds, but hey, we still have no idea how much that is as an audience in 2019. So I had to use two different websites and convert the money to um, nowadays money, and it's about 580,000 euros. That's about, let's call it 
six hundred thousand dollars American yeah. dollars. That's not that much, really. Um, I mean, it's half a million dollars or euros, but it's not the hundred million dollars that we get in the yeah, in the film. One one hundred and eleven million five hundred. Yeah, exactly something like that. Um, yeah. No, but. Probably you've also taken into account the inflation. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's still you can a lot be of a money. Very, but... very poor villain at the time and still be successful. <laughs> I don't. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say no to a working capital of uh... half a million uh, dollars or euros. Yeah. So to round off this first part, I want to listen to the last paragraph of this chapter, which is when Bond falls asleep. For ten minutes, he lay on his left side, reflecting on the events of the day. Then he turned over and focused his mind towards the tunnel of sleep. His last action was to slip his right hand under the pillow until it rested under the butt of the .38 Colt Police Positive with the sawn barrel. Then he slept, and with the warmth and humor of his eyes extinguished, his features relapsed into a taciturn mask, ironical, brutal, and cold. And thus ends the very first chapter of Casino Royale. Now, what do you think, Tom? Um, just a fun little bit of trivia. The .38 Cold Police positive with the sawn barrel uh, was featured on the cover of From Russia with Love, I believe, the novel. Ah, the hand-drawn cover, you mean? Yeah, because it's a, it's a gun that, that Fleming got for special services. It was a... It was inscribed with... For during the war? Sense. Yeah, during the war, after the war, I believe. Something like that. Is that where Gardner took the title from, for special services? Exactly, yeah. Uh, it all makes sense now, yeah. Yeah, it all comes together. Yeah, perfect. Now, I already feel like I know a bit about this James Bond character, you know, someone very professional and very cool, and you want to read on. But this is something that Fleming does a lot. We're going to go to chapter two. And we go back in time. Yeah, back in time. Chapter 2, Dossier for M. And in this second chapter, we see a famous Ian Fleming trope. In the first chapter, we, the reader, are more or less dropped straight into Bond's mission. We start in the middle, but the second chapter often serves as a flashback to the beginning of the mission. And in this case, we travel back two weeks in time, where M, head of MI6, receives a memorandum from head of S, entitled A Project for the Destruction of Monsieur Le Chiffre. Of course, this chapter serves mostly for exposition, so we get some information about the bad guy Le Chiffre, and the Soviet organization Smirsch, and of course the mission itself. Uh, long story short, Le Chiffre used Soviet money to buy a chain of brothels. Um, unfortunately for him, the French government passed law number 46685, and this law made brothels illegal, so Le Chiffre lost a lot of money overnight. Uh, he wants to get it back by playing some high-stakes Baccarat at the Casino Royale in Les Eaux. I don't know. Well, you said you like this uh, this chapter as well. Yeah, well, I pretty much love the entire book. So, yeah, yeah, so it's probably going to be a love fest. But we see... Important question, Tyler. Important question. M. Does it have a period or not? Uh, depending on which... Is it just M? Depending or is it on which M book you're reading, he's not period. consistent with that as well. Fleming isn't consistent with that. No, but you have to choose. Choose. Um, in... in <laughs> I would say without a period. No, oh, I would say with a period. Well, there you go. <laughs> We're both happy. Oh, I love him. He's such a great character. Yeah, and he's he already hears his testy self, um, especially when he calls out head of S for the ladder. Uh, let me try this. Let me try this. I, I wrote it down. It's the French law, and it's written in the dossier. It's called Loi tendant à la fermeture des maisons de la tolérance et au renforcement de la lutte contre le proxénitisme. Yeah. Or something like that. <laughs> what does this sentence mean? This is not a Berlitz <laughs> school of languages. Ab's not having it. Oh, this is great. Yeah. Yeah. Right in English, he does. Yeah, him. I love that part. No, but, but this this really just sets up the plot. We get a nice, concise discussion about the goal of the mission. Yeah. Um, about the villain, about the organization he's working for. It just... Think of how, if the book would have started with this chapter, you'd probably be bored out it's of your boring. Brain. Yeah. So it's, a, it's but now it makes sense. Exactly. So it's a great way to start the book with the first chapter, as in this case with uh, with Bond just being royal as oil already, and then coming back to this. I, I really like that. Uh, yeah, it's uh, something he does uh, more frequently. Yeah. So we find out that Le Chiffre is broke and he needs about 50 million francs, old French francs. It's uh, uh, well over a million uh, euros or dollars nowadays. 
And what's also important is that Le Chiffre seems to be unaware that his life might be at stake, that Smirsch might be on his tail already. Uh, we don't know what Smirsch is yet, but it will be explained later. And they assume that Le Chiffre will start to gamble to make good his deficit in his accounts. And they assume that he will go to Royal because there you have the casino with the high stakes. And then you get a proposed counter operation. Now, this is something I really like because I don't think they did it justice in the film. And I think they do it very well in the book. Uh, MI6 basically wants Le Chiffre to be ridiculed and destroyed. That goal would be achieved if Le Chiffre would be defeated at the tables. And this is something that they didn't explain in the film. They cannot just assassinate him. That would be pointless because if they would assassinate him, then Russia would quickly cover up his uh, defalcations and make him into a martyr. Mm -hmm. I think that's very smart to, to explain it like that. It is. So let's listen to the proposed plan made by Head of S. Proposed counter operation. It would be greatly in the interests of this country and of the other nations of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization that this powerful Soviet agent should be ridiculed and destroyed, that his communist trade union should be bankrupted and brought into disrepute, and that this potential fifth column, with a strength of 50,000, capable in time of war of controlling a wide sector of France's northern frontier, should lose faith and cohesion. All this would result if Le Chiffre could be defeated at the tables. Nota bene. Assassination is pointless. Leningrad would quickly cover up his defalcations and make him into a martyr. We therefore recommend that the finest gambler available to the service should be given the necessary funds and endeavour to outgamble this man. The risks are obvious, and the possible loss to the secret funds is high, but other operations on which large sums have been hazarded have had fewer chances of success, often for a smaller objective. If the decision is unfavourable, the only alternative would be to place our information and our recommendations in the hands of the Deuxième Bureau, or of our American colleagues at the Central Intelligence Agency in Washington. Both of these organisations would doubtless be delighted to take over the scheme. Signed, S. Now this paragraph, it ends with um, a reference to the Deuxième Bureau, or the American colleagues of the CIA, and we will come back to that later on. But it's a nice, uh, nice little reference that M doesn't seem to like very much. <laughs> this chapter also has two appendices, and we find out stuff about Le Chiffre. Yeah. Now, Tyler, what do you think of Le Chiffre? Well, I, I especially like the fact that he is silent up until the somewhere chapter 20, I believe. He's just... Doing his thing, quiet, menacing, using his benzedrine inhaler the entire time, and I don't know, he's just a just a creepy character. He is a creepy character, and he, I, I can imagine, he looks awful. Yeah. What what kind of animal do you think about when I when I describe the way he, Fleming describes him? He's five foot eight inches, and I had to do some converting here again. That's one meter and seventy two centimeters. So it's quite short yep. and he weighs 18 stone, which is about 114 kilos. Yeah, so that he's probably something massive. Like, a, like a beaver or a, or a boar or something like that. He's like shorter than I am and twice my weight. It's like massive. Yeah. He has red brown hair like all villains will have in the Fleming books, <laughs> I think. <laughs> so he does, Fleming doesn't like redheads. No. <laughs> His eyes are very dark brown with whites showing all round irises. Now that's impossible. There's another villain who has this that as well. Maybe it's Blofeld in, in Thunderbolt. Really? Yeah. Oh, we'll, we'll find out. It seems impossible. He has small, a small mouth, small hands and small feet, he dresses well, smokes incessantly. He, sm he smokes a, a brand called Caporos, I think you pronounce it. A strong, dark tobacco. And like you said, he, he uses a benzendrine inhaler like uh, Mads Mikkelsen also does in the film, uh, obviously. Yeah. yeah. I like this one. Does not laugh. He's, he's a serious bugger, isn't he? <laughs> a real agent of Smirsch. Has large sexual appetites. Yeah, that's why he started, or he bought the brothels. Yeah, uh, probably, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have this image of a toad, but I, I don't know if that's uh, correct. But, yeah. oh. You have a different image? Like a swine or something? Yeah, like a know. boar or something like that. Yeah. I believe Rosa Klepp is being this, it, it's described as a, as a toad. 
book. She is. Yeah, yeah. you're right. Yeah, she is. Let's let's uh, keep, call him a swine or a boar. Yeah. He's an expert driver, adept with small arms in combat, and he knows his mathematics. Hence the name Le Chiffre. Yeah. And what's also important is he's always accompanied by two armed guards. Yeah, and also because he's he's nothing more than a number on his passport, right? Something he's Le Chiffre, yeah, yeah right, because he's anonymous. Yeah. Also kinda like Drax in Moonraker, right? They didn't know where Drax came from. No. No, it's more or less the villain blueprints. He's he's ugly. Yeah. He's short. He's red hair. <laughs> red hair. Where he's coming from? Well, there you and go. he's foreign. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Large sexual appetites. There you go. He must be Bond. Well, Bond has large sexual appetites, I think. And then the chapter ends with uh, some details on Smirsch. Schmert Spionum. I can only hear this in the voice of uh, what's uh, what's his name, Gimli. <laughs> ah, uh, John General Davis? Pushkin. Yeah, John Rice Davies, yeah. Schmerz yeah. yeah. <laughs> The very operation from Stalin's time. <laughs> Death to spies, yeah. So, the Smirsch task is they need to eliminate all forms of treachery and backsliding with the various branches of the Soviet secret service and secret police at home and abroad. I like it. It's very um, feared and powerful. It's a quite... It would be, I like what you said, it would be a very boring chapter if you would start with this. Yeah, but it, it makes total sense after that first chapter. It really, yeah. it really makes you read like, oh, okay, so this is what we're doing. Can't wait to find out more. Mm. You want to go to chapter three? Let's do it. Okay, so the title of this chapter is number 007. Here we go. You get a lot of exposition, obviously, because it's the first book and, and Fleming has to explain everything. We find out that head of S... Uh, who wrote the dossier for M stands for Soviet Union. And for anyone who, who doesn't uh, know what the Soviet Union was, it's, uh, let's just call it Russia. Belittles the Cold War considerably, but yeah, yeah. Know, for, for uh, to make it easier, yeah. So uh, the, the Russians are the bad guys. And we find out in this chapter how MI6 works. We find out about the inner workings and the employees. We meet Bill Tanner. And he is an ex-sapper. I had to look this up. A sapper is a soldier responsible for tasks such as building and repairing roads and bridges, laying and clearing mines. Right. He's also supposed to be um, Bond's best friend. We don't get Bill Tanner in the book, sadly. Uh, in the film. No, but I think we have enough characters in the film to make yeah, the film that's interesting. True. But we get Villiers in the, in the film. Yeah, and Molaka and Mr. White and... We got a lot of characters in the film that now that uh, yeah, we, we just well, start with M and then we we build from there up until Spain. yeah. We also meet Miss Moneypenny, M's personal secretary. Yeah, she is described by Fleming as being desirable, but for eyes which were cool and direct and quizzical. Now, what do you think of this analysis? Yeah, there's not much. Also, in the other books, there's not really the flirting or the flirtatious relationship between Bond and uh, and Money Penny. No, no, it, there isn't. He used he usually flirts with his own secretary. Yeah, uh, which is never in the films. But don't you think it's kind of horrible how Fleming describes a woman by her attractiveness to men, and he describes the men by their skills? Yeah, probably. <laughs> Come on, he is a bastard. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, probably. She's you a very confident have, secretary. I, she is, yeah. And I don't know if it's the times or anything, but it's just weird to describe a woman basically only by what she looks like and then describe a guy by what he can do. Yeah. It's just weird. But we'll, we'll, we'll have plenty of more of those uh, occurrences yeah. in this book and probably in the, in the next books as well. Yeah, usually oh, uh, Bond just puts people down like he does with Galabrand, like a real secretary doesn't scratch her ear with a pencil. Th things like that. It's it's always just, uh, well, you're not really worth your salt. <laughs> I like the, the, the attention to detail. Uh, I love it that a black folder with a red star is being used and it means top secret. That makes me want to buy black folders and put red stars on it. You know, it's <laughs> something I could have at home. But um, yeah, I, I like the way that it works in MI6. It's all very proper. You know, head of S comes with his dossier. He has to pass it to the chief of staff who brings it to M. Uh, no, he first he, he rings M and then he can go in and then he comes back and they wait. And just, it takes its time. Yeah, Nowadays, Money Penny just... is, is really the gatekeeper, right? She's, yeah. is he in? Yeah, go ahead. How are we going to do this? How are we going to get him to agree on our, on our plan? 
I believe there's also something in there like we almost shot ourselves in the foot with that last sentence. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, this is the way that it goes. Later, a triumphant head of S said to his number two, we nearly cooked ourselves with that last paragraph. He said it was subversion and blackmail. He got pretty sharp about it. And when I read that section, it's, it's pretty, pretty funny. Because it made me want to go back and reread the last paragraph. I didn't remember the, the paragraph. It's what we listened to in chapter one as well. So what was so bad about it ahead of us? No, but I, I think it's funny because it, it, it shows that people are really tiptoeing around M. Um, yeah. And one little mistake or one little one, one little oversight might, might get your head bitten off by the guy. Exactly. Exactly. Really, it tells you a lot about how it goes on. Yeah. Yeah. He's really yeah. a feared get character within that service. Yeah, he is. Well, he should be. He should be. And um, I like it as well. We don't get uh, we don't get it in this book yet, but in later books we will. That the character of M also is humanized a lot more, and we get more of his inner conflicts and stuff like that. But we'll get to that. Yeah. yeah. So M approves, and let's listen to to what Head of S has to say about that. Anyway, he approves. Says the idea is crazy, but worth trying if the treasury will play, and he thinks they will. He's going to tell them it's a better gamble than the money we're putting into deserting Russian colonels who turn double after a few months' asylum here. And he's longing to get at Le Chief. And anyway, he's got the right man and wants to try him out on the job. Now, this paragraph to me is essential to the whole mission, and it lacks from the film. You know, here basically M signifies that the whole operation isn't that ludicrous to begin with. It's a point that Vesper makes in the film, you know, that there is a plan. But it tells you also something about Bond. You know, he's, like you said, he's not a rookie agent, but here M also says he wants to try him out on the job. That's so he's not, okay. he's not, maybe he's not the, the, the seasoned officer, But he, even though he acts as a very professional Yeah, and he already had that, had that mission with the Romanians with the, uh, with the Invisible Inked in another casino. Yeah. I believe that they're referring to that as well. But maybe those are missions before he actually became a double O. Yeah, probably. And he's been working his way up within the Secret Service. He's not an incompetent fool like he is in the movie. Definitely not, definitely not. And Bond should never be an incompetent fool, I think. Agreed. So Bond is being briefed by M. M asks about Bond's thoughts on the mission and Bond begins to explain he might not win. Which is a good point, valid point. And this is like, he tries to explain the odds to M, but then suddenly, I, I love that, Bond is being stopped by M's cold eyes. I like that. Bond was stopped by the cold eyes. M knew all this already. Knew the odds at Baccarat as well as Bond. That was his job. Knowing the odds at everything. And knowing men, his own and the opposition's. Bond wished he had kept quiet about his misgivings. Yeah, there, there is a scene in, I think it's in Colonel Sun, where one of the henchmen is, is explaining to Colonel Sun why, why a plan fails. And Colonel Sun just raises his hand, just slightly, and the guy stops talking and he starts over again and he, Sun raises his hands again. That's about the same that's happening here. Just the look of M can be enough to hold you in your place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I like, I like that. And then M sends him to Q to talk about rooms and trains and any equipment. I'd never realized that we already have a queue. Yeah, but he doesn't say queue branch. He says, have a talk to queue. Yeah, that's probably the only time that we hear about queue and not Major Boothroyd. Yeah, maybe. But he doesn't know Major Boothroyd yet. No, but maybe they're, they're he not means gadgets or anything like that. They're more like no? travel arrangements. Equipment, and, yeah. Uh... yeah, 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 that's true. Mm. That's what a quartermaster does, but yeah. Ah, so far I, for I just found it funny, yeah. Uh, but that's it. We never meet any Q kind of uh, character in this book. M tells Bond he will inform the Deuxième Bureau, which is, if you haven't caught up yet, uh, it's like the MI6 of France. Bond is hoping that he will work together with Mati. I think it's more like the, the MI5 of France because it's the internal oh. service, right? Oh, yeah, that could be. That could be. Yeah, makes sense because it's set in France. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, and the CIA, who might also be interested. The American and CIA. The American CIA, yeah. And then I like this. This is also like a, a Detective Columbo almost. One more thing, and we'll send someone extra with Bond. And then Bond finishes out the chapter. Bond would have preferred to work alone, but he didn't argue. He hoped the man they would send would be loyal to him, and neither stupid, or worse still, ambitious or even worse yet 
a woman. Ah, uh, that would be even worse. Yeah. A <laughs> fate worse than a fate. Worse than death. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But I like that. I had to read that a, a couple of times uh, when I first read this book. What, what does he mean? Neither stupid or worse still, ambitious. Bond What's wrong a, with being ambitious? Bond is just a loner. He wants to make his own plan and do his own stuff. And he doesn't really need anyone to tell him, to give him any advice along the way. He's an, he's an expert. He doesn't need anyone. Yeah, I, th I, think that's, I think that's true. Yeah, But also, if you're ambitious, you start making mistakes because um, you want to show off. Yeah, or at least you don't listen to your superiors. Yeah, lots of problems. Yeah, well, don't be ambitious. Never be ambitious. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that was chapter three. Let's uh, move on. Let's continue with chapter four, L'Enemy Écoute. Well, we're back in the present day, or at least the present day for this novel. And Bond awakes in his hotel room at the Hotel Splendide. And we get a bit of information about the way Bond gambles. He, uh, he plays a roulette, betting on the even chances. So that means uh, black or red, odd or even, and the first one through 18 or 19 through 36. And of course, being a Bond fan, <laughs> whenever I play roulette, I often do this as well. Just betting on black or just on the even numbers makes your money last a lot longer yeah, because you have a 50-50 or about a 50-50 chance when playing. But you also always lose in the end, right? Uh, well... You shouldn't play to win. You should play to have fun. When you go out for a for a night at the casino, just just see it as an evening out. When you when mm. you go out to a bar or to a, to a restaurant, you also spend money. Mm, so that's true. If you go to a casino and you spend a bit of money and you lose a bit of money, that's okay. If you had a if you had a nice evening, mm. as long as you don't use money that you can't lose, you're. I think you're good. Yeah. There's another tactic that Bond uses as well. I'm not sure if it's in this novel or in another one where he plays the two of the three dozens. So one through 12 and 13 through 24, for instance. I often do that as well. So I just, I just think it's funny that you, you pick up on things like that. Mm. And you start, yeah. you start using them in real life. Bond also plays some Baccarat at Casino Royale to give his nerves and card sense a good workout. So before the big game with Le Chiffre, he really... Just warms up a bit. But what is that? What is card sense? I mean, how can you well, train that? I mean, you never know what the next card will be. In 1954, it was his nickname, right? It's card sense Jimmy Bond. So yeah, he <laughs> um, probably got it from there. No, it's it's. I don't know. When I when I haven't played poker for a while, I know that I'm a lot more careful and. You're not sharp. I'm not sharp, and also play a bit more passively than I would like to. So it usually takes a while to, to get back into the groove and and play the game and the, the way you, you want to play and you should play right. and you're used to play. So I, I think it's something like that. Just feeling whether you should you should hit on that five or you should stand on that five in Baccarat. I don't know. It's probably just to get the juices flowing. I'm not sure, mm. but, I, but I can see where he's coming from. Okay, yeah, good. So, and we learned that Bond has been in, at Casino Royale for two days and he's already won three million in francs. So the three thousand pounds. I don't know how much that is in now money nowadays. A lot. He wants some. <laughs> <laughs> and and we learn and I, I really love this part. We learn a bit about Bond's breakfast. A really a hearty breakfast uh, of uh, I believe a pint of orange juice, uh, scrambled egg with, with bacon, and a double portion of coffee without sugar, of course. And we also read about his famous custom-made cigarettes. The Moreland Special, which are a blend of Balkan and Turkish tobacco, especially made for, for Bond. Yeah. So basically, if you want to live your life as Bond, all you have to do is read Casino Royale carefully. And you know what to eat, you know what to smoke, Yeah, uh, you know exactly what you should do with your days. Yeah, yeah. and James... It's like a blueprint. 007 in New York even gives you the famous recipe of his, uh, mm, his travel bags. Yeah. bags. So if you've read that, then you're good to go. Let's see how long you make it on strong coffee, bacon, eggs, and 70 cigarettes a day. And let's not even talk about the, the amounts of alcohol he consumes, <laughs> uh, but we'll get to that. And now we get to probably one of my favorite scenes from the novel, Mathis or Mati. No, let's call him René Mati. Yeah, let's, let's go for Mati. I like that as well. Um, so René Mati uh, arrives at, uh, at Bond's hotel room. And instead of jovially greeting Bond, he poses as the director of Radio Stendor. He places a large radio near the fireplace, turns the volume up to 11, and turns the radio on. Because apparently the Russians know of the British plan and buck Bond's hotel room. 
And thanks to Mati, those Russian spies are now death. Like like I said, I really love this scene because clever Mati doesn't break character until he knows for sure that they can't be overheard. And he just, he sort of makes fun of Bond. Like we, the clever French, knows what's going on and you're just bumbling around thinking you're not overheard, but they know everything you're doing. You know why they know why you're here. Yeah, I, I, I really love this scene. Because Matt is, the, is so competent in this uh, in this novel. Yeah, he is. He's very competent, and he knows exactly what uh, what he has to do. And the first time I read this, I was so bamboozled by what was going on. I mean, what what is he doing? And it all makes sense after a few paragraphs. But at first, you're like, what is he doing? Why is he setting up a radio? Why is he playing loud music? And then they're whispering. Uh, oh, it's very, very, very clever. I, I like it. Yeah. Yeah. And we are, we are, of course, made to believe that uh, Bond and Mattis already know each other. So they already. Mati. Oh, sorry, Mati. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they already have that history together, so they're they're like old friends that meet up, and and I like that. It, not every encounter is is with a new person. Bond has a history mm. before Casino Royale. Yeah, yeah, that is good. Yeah. yeah, what I also like about their conversation is that they have no explanation for how Bond's cover could have been blown so quickly. They don't understand it. They realize it has been blown, but they don't know how. And I think this is already a little seed being sown for the end of the book. Right. Right. Because we know how it ends. Yeah. Yeah, I never thought of it like that. But that's a, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. That's my, my brainwave for to, for tonight. Yeah. yeah. Woohoo. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, that's why I love doing things like this. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> and then we get the best part. Mati goes to explain his number two is very beautiful indeed. <laughs> yes, with all the right protuberances. <laughs> Back and front. Yes, it yeah. was a, look I had, uh, a word I had to look up, I remember, when I, when I first read it. First of all, and he inhaled a thick lungful of caporal, you will be pleased with your number two. She is very beautiful. Bond frowned. Very beautiful indeed. Satisfied with Bond's reaction, Matisse continued. She has black hair, blue eyes, and splendid uh, protuberances. Back and front, he added. Now, what about Bond's reaction to this? What the <laughs> hell do they want to send me a woman for? <laughs> That's horrible. Yeah, but he, he, he really isn't too pleased just to work with a lady on this assignment. No, he is not, no. It's not like... This doesn't really change, right? Not even, not even Mary Goodnight in in the Man with the Golden Gun is really competent, or no? It's basically, and I don't know if this is Fleming or Bond or both or just rich white men in the fifties. It's basically women are for sex and to look at, and men are to do the job. Yeah, yeah. That that that's it. And if you have a problem with that then don't read Fleming, I think. <laughs> no, or, or at least take it on face value. I mean, it, it was written in 90, 1960 or 55, 52, I'm sorry. Let's be glad that times have changed a bit. Yes, what I want to make clear is that we don't agree with this, or I don't agree with this, and I hope you don't agree with this, but we can't change it. But then again, you know, at the same time, Fleming was kind of... Uh, entitled to his opinion as well you know, that's his time. the way exactly that's the way it was for him and let's not forget that probably we nowadays think that we are very liberal or, or progressive or whatever but 20 years from now when we look back at, at what we are discussing right now or what we think is 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 right it might have changed is again, probably yeah. backwards thinking for that period of time so yeah like i said don't judge a book by your 2019 standards. But Mati reassures Bond that she is very capable and it would also fit his cover. Now that I like. It would fit his cover as a Jamaican millionaire to pick up a beautiful girl. Yes. And which is kind of clever break, from... Uh... Especially in the evening. Let's see, what else happens? Well, they make plans for drinks before lunch. Yeah, Mati also tells Bond there's a CIA chap called Felix Leiter. So we never heard that name before. Nope. And they make plans. And Mati leaves. 
Yeah, and Bond is left to ponder the day ahead of him. Yeah, and he doesn't like it. No. He starts to be a bit afraid that an attempt might be made on his life, even. Yeah, and he and he also f- discover or he also thinks of a nickname for Vesper. This is where the first time he calls her a bitch. Ah, right, yeah. Well, he doesn't know she's called Vesper yet. No, that's, but, that's yeah, true. yeah. It's uh, the end of the chapter, which is, I think, a very funny end. So let's listen to that. And then there was this pest of a girl. He sighed. Women were for recreation. On a job, they got in the way and fogged things up with sex and hurt feelings and all the emotional baggage they carried around. One had to look out for them and take care of them. Bitch, said Bond, and then, remembering the Munces, he said, Bitch, again, more loudly, and walked out of the room. Now, Bond is not the nicest character, is he? No, he isn't, but Bond isn't a funny character per se, but the books and Fleming's writing is very funny. Yeah, I can because laugh at this, things, definitely. Because of yeah. little things like this. Yeah, I, li- I like this dark humor. Yeah, definitely. So that was chapter four? Uh, yeah, let's go to chapter five. Chapter five, The Girl from Headquarters. Now, this chapter begins with a lovely description of the area. Fleming describes the sights and the smells and even the history of the fictitious Royale. You can imagine I thought this was real, right? I mean, he is so detailed. The entire chapter is 11 pages, and the first three pages are used for all this background, which is basically padding. We also get some information on the casino, which doesn't really exist. But, you know, it's kind of nice the way Fleming describes everything. But that, that's what I, I like about this book. Not much is happening. It's really, it just flows from one scene to the next and it really takes its time yeah and the plot is very straightforward yeah you know what has to be done and all this really makes you feel like you are present yeah and that helps that really helps yeah it's I like not that. one of those and then and then and then and then and then stories it really takes its time it sets up the location it sets up the the characters yeah really like it so what we get in the book are also these small insights into bond's feelings and his thoughts and i like that even if they're only momentarily like this one i'm gonna quote fleming against the background of this luminous and sparkling stage bond stood in the sunshine and felt his mission to be incongruous and remote, and his dark profession an affront to his fellow actors. He doesn't like it. No. But then he shrugs away the feeling, and he continues. He also doesn't like killing. No. But he does take pride in doing it well. Yeah. But I like it. I like it that we... He is a three-dimensional character. Uh, I think that's very important. Mm. But he does it anyway, so... You know, he decides to have a look at Le Chiffre's uh, villa and to reconnoiter the, the surroundings before he will meet uh, Mati and the girl at the Hermitage Bar. And we get a lovely bit about Bond's only personal hobby. His car. Bond's car was his only personal hobby. One of the last of the four and a half litre Bentleys with the supercharger by Amherst Villas, he had bought it almost new in 1933 and had kept it in careful storage through the war. It was still serviced every year, and in London, a former Bentley mechanic who worked in a garage near Bond's Chelsea flat tended it with jealous care. Bond drove it hard and well, and with an almost sensual pleasure. It was a battleship grey convertible coupe, which really did convert, and it was capable of touring at 90 with 30 miles an hour in reserve. Now this is something that Martin would like, uh, especially, I think this part i think so too yeah. yeah i'm not the car nut of us no me neither i can uh what i can enjoy is that everything that bond does he does well i can relate to that that he enjoys it for himself he's a very manly man you know he likes his cars he he, he likes good food and stuff like that now i think that when fleming describes him he wants every one of us to envy bond i don't know how you feel about that no i i don't think so because he is a flawed character. Well, he's he's a human. Yeah, but no, I I I wouldn't say that I envy Bond, but I think Fleming would have loved to be Bond. Yeah, maybe he's like a, a fictitious version of Fleming, how he would have wanted his life to have gone, or something like that. Mm. Maybe, yeah. But we don't read about the uh, reconnoitering. We just get a jump cut to the Hermitage. 
so we don't actually read what Bond was doing, but then he's sitting at the bar and Mati and the girl, they come in, there's a bit more play acting, uh, that they happen to meet each other by chance, and then Mati introduces Mademoiselle Lind, so we don't know her first name yet. And while Bond and Mati are chatting cheerfully, Bond steals glances at Miss Lind, adding up his impressions. And she smokes one of Bond's cigarettes appreciatively, without affection. And her movements are economical and precise. No trace of self-consciousness. She stays very still and very quiet. Doesn't fiddle with her hair. Mm. We get a whole page describing the way she looked. Some parts from that are her hair was very black. And she wore it cut square and low on the nape of the neck framing her face to below the clear and beautiful line of her jaw. Fleming really loves describing women. <laughs> yes. Her eyes were wide apart and a deep blue and gazed candidly back at Bond with a touch of ironical disinterest. Her skin was lightly suntanned and bore no trace of makeup except on her mouth which was wide and sensual and her medium-length dress was of grey soie sauvage with a square-cut bodice lavishly tight across her fine breasts. Yeah, isn't this Fleming to a T? A, <laughs> a, a wide and sensual mouth? They all have that in his novel. Yeah. Well, there can be only one conclusion. Bond was excited by her beauty and intrigued by her composure and the prospect of working with her stimulated him. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. So, Mati leaves briefly to go to the phone booth and then Miss Lind and Bond plan to go to the casino together. This is an essential part of this chapter when uh, Mati uh, left the table briefly. They are alone now at the table and she seems to warm up a bit and Bond feels confident that they will work well together. This is very interesting, I think. Bond says, no, Fleming says, he was quite honest to himself about the hypocrisy of his attitude towards her. As a woman, he wanted to sleep with her but only when the job had been done. Yeah, business before pleasure. Yeah, now this is something I, I, I lifted from uh, a website, an analysis of this, uh, this bit. And it said that Bond just wants to have sex with her as a show of his dominance and her submission. What do you think of that theme? Oh, oh wow. That's deep, isn't it? Yeah, that might take it a bit further than I would want to go myself, but... Well, there are some parallel themes ahead when it's being described the role that Bond has as opposed to the Deuxième Bureau and the CIA. I mean, he is in control. He gets to make all the decisions and all the others are just there to support him. And Fleming writes pretty basically here, he wanted to sleep with her, but only when the job had been done. Yeah. Well, at least he's being honest about it. Yeah. What I like about the end of this chapter is that it's written from a narrator's point of view. So we also get a little insight into what uh, Ms. Lind is thinking. Let's listen to that. The girl's eyes followed him out onto the boulevard. Matisse moved his chair close to hers and said softly, That is a very good friend of mine. I am glad you have met each other. I can already feel the ice flows on the two rivers breaking up. He smiled. I don't think Bond has ever been melted. It will be a new experience for him. And for you. She did not answer him directly. He is very good-looking. He reminds me rather of Hoagie Carmichael. But there is something cold and ruthless in his... Hoagie Carmichael. Ah, uh, yes. I had to look him up, though, <laughs> see what he looked like. <laughs> yeah, we get a description of Bond physically and mentally through the eyes of a woman. And I think Fleming here again wants us to admire or envy Bond. You know, you want to be like him. I mean, I want to be considered to be good looking. Yeah. Don't we all? Would be nice. Yeah. It's a very strange ending because in mid-sentence of Miss Lynn's description, the chapter ends with a terrific explosion very near the Hermitage. And the plate glass window is shattered and there are screams and a stampede for the door. What just happened? This is also part of what you called the Fleming sweep that you want to... Yeah, this is not a chapter that you end your day on. You No, you can't stop here. Exactly. You want to continue to, into the next chapter, chapter six. Yeah, two men is all right. for all heads. Chapter six. So Bond leaves uh, Mathis and Vesper after lunch, heads back to his hotel. And he sees two suspicious men loitering around the hotel. And they are dressed alike, and both are carrying a camera case. 
Uh, one red and one blue. Uh, before we know it, there's a blinding flash of white light and 007 is thrown to the pavement. Blue man and red man have exploded and their remains are raining down on Bond. This is a gruesome scene, isn't it? It is awful. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. It's raining flesh. It, it literally is raining man, come to think of it. <laughs> um, but Bond is saved by a tree that is directly in between him and Mr. Blue and Senor Red. So he's yeah. just lucky. He's a very lucky escape. What do you think, yeah. uh, Don? Is, is this Fleming at its best, or should Bond survive because of his own actions and not because of some conveniently located tree? Um, I really don't have a preference. It, I mean, it shows... What I like about this bit is that it shows that Bond is suspicious about what's going on. He immediately, for some reason, yeah. these men catch his attention. They seem out of place. Yeah, they stand out like a sore thumb. But he is clueless. Yeah. He just walks on, trying to figure out what's going on. And then you get the explosion, a very powerful image. It is a bit... Do you, do you consider it to be lazy writing to have Bond survive because he was behind a tree trunk? No, or... I, don't, I wouldn't call it lazy writing, but it, like you said, we all want to be Bond and we need to envy Bond. And this is just something, just sheer luck saves his life. Yeah. It, it, yeah. it goes against everything you've seen and read so far. Yeah. Um, he realizes it, though. Yeah. He realizes that he True. has been very, very lucky. That he's still alive and um yeah so so quite shaken bond ends up in his hotel room yeah mati rushes out and 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 picks him up and, and takes him to the hotel yeah and they go to their room together and they have to switch on the radio again because of the months of so. course and mati wants to know everything and yeah uh, everything of bond uh, what happens what he what he saw and he Again, like I said, Mati is really capable in the, in this novel. He takes care of everything. He calls the police. He's, he's in charge here. Yeah, yeah. He, he calls the police and he, he makes sure that there are roadblocks around. Well, they yeah they suspect there was a third man. Exactly. So these two men they were blown up, but they suspect there should be a third man. Yeah. So so roadblocks are put up. Bond is being well tended to by by Mati. Vesper calls Bond to ask how he's doing. If everything is all right. And I like the fact that Mati also lets the world know that Bond is okay. Shook up, but still okay. So his cover remains intact. And also going into the game with uh, with Le Chiffre, he has a bit of an edge because he's shook up, I guess. Yeah, maybe. Do you think they should have included this in the film, this bit? I, I read it in my in my article on, on our website regarding things that they left out of the movie that are in the novel. This, this is such an amazing scene it is and i'm not quite but should sure. it be in the film i mean we have a perfect scene here in a book already i think it could have been after michael g wilson gets arrested mm -hmm. um, it would have fit pretty good after that scene and that instead of the poisoning scene that we get later on in the film yeah don't really like that scene all that much i i think this would have been a great replacement for that so after Vesper calls, Bond is left to his own devices. Yeah. Shaken but not stirred. Uh, Shaken but not stirred. Yeah. Bond He's happy has, even. Yeah. Bond has lunch and prepares for the rest of the day. Yeah. He lives, but somehow sees it as a as a positive outcome because two of the of the opposition are dead and he's still alive so yeah that's two to zero for the good guys yeah exactly it's uh, yeah not too shabby so we go to chapter seven I think. Rouge et noir, and for any people that don't speak any French, that's red and black. I think that's from the casino, right? Bond has to prepare himself for the night at the casino. I like this. He orders a masseur, a Swede. I like it. Whenever Fleming writes that, uh, the masseur showed up. It was a Swede. I can immediately picture him. I, yeah. I can see what he would look like. Six Tall foot five, guy. blonde. <laughs> yeah. And then Bond sleeps a dreamless sleep. And he awakes in the evening completely refreshed. And again, he takes a cold shower. Why? Why would you do it's that? It's a great start of the day. No, it's not a great start of the day. It's not a great start <laughs> of an evening. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. I think every Bond fan has tried it at least once. No, not every Bond fan has tried it. No? Wow. <laughs> no, I haven't. I'm not going to take a cold shower. I'm not crazy. <laughs> Oh, Fleming describes more of Bond's personality. Uh, he says that Bond has always been a gambler. He loves the riffle of the cards, the, the solid comfort of the room, the luxury, the champagne, the good servants. He likes being both an actor and a spectator. 
And above all, he likes it that everything is one's own fault. The deadly sin is to mistake bad play for bad luck. Yes, don't mistake the outcome with the decision. Mm. Then Bond compares luck to a woman and we get some more masochistic <laughs> fantasizing about needing to woo or ravage a woman. I mean, what, what, what's up with that? What was wrong with Fleming? <laughs> he had something to, to prove, I guess. I remember the ending of The Spy Who Loved Me. It's horrible. He describes it that every yeah. woman wants to be semi-raped. Yeah. Or something like that. It's, it's problematic sometimes. Yeah. 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 <sighs> Okay. Let's call it artistic freedom. Let's just <laughs> well, you could it. call it that. Yeah. <laughs> so, Bond is in the casino. We get a bit more gambling. Again, Bond puts a lot of effort into the details. He's studying the chef's card at the roulette table, looking at the run of the bowl. And we get a, a little wisdom. Bond simply maintained that the more effort and ingenuity you put into gambling, the more you took out. Yeah. That's quite nice. I like that. Life is more you know, fun when you put a bit of effort in it. Exactly. Yeah. It's not just gambling. I think that goes for anything. Yeah. yeah. So then he finally starts to gamble himself at the roulette table, playing in maximums, and he meets Felix Leiter for the first time. Yeah. And they order drinks, and you get the famous shaken vodka martini. Yeah, and I, I love the way that Felix makes his presence known by just copying Bond's play at the roulette table, doing the exact same thing as he does, playing the same numbers or playing the same... Uh, same plaques. I, I like that. Yeah. And then afterward, they walk off with each other and uh, and Leiter says, hey, uh, thanks for the ride. Can I offer you a drink? My name's Felix Leiter, said the American. Glad to meet you. Mine's Bond. James Bond. Oh, yes, said his companion. Now, let's see. What should we have to celebrate? Bond insisted on ordering Leiter's Hague and Hague on the rocks, and then he looked carefully at the barman. A dry martini, he said. One, in a deep champagne goblet. Oui, monsieur. Just a moment. Three measures of Gordon's, one of vodka, half a measure of Kina Lillet. Shake it very well until it's ice cold. Then add a large, thin slice of lemon peel. Got it? Certainly, monsieur. The barman seemed pleased with the idea. Gosh, that's certainly a drink said Leiter. Bond laughed. When I'm uh, concentrating, he explained, I never have more than one drink before dinner. But I do like that one to be large and very strong and very cold and very well made. I hate small portions of anything, particularly when they taste bad. This drink's my own invention. I'm going to patent it when I can think of a good name. He watched carefully as the deep glass became frosted with the pale golden drink, slightly aerated by the bruising of the shaker. He reached for it and took a long sip. Excellent, he said to the barman. Now, what I find strange is, and we talked about this, I think, in the film review, Bond says, I hate small portions of anything, particularly when they taste bad. Yeah, it's always better to have something that tastes horrible and have to drink And have a, a lot large portion. Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand that. No. But I don't know. I can't explain that one. No, me neither. I, I never got that. Or he just hates small portions, and even more so if it also tastes bad. I don't know. Yeah, but still, it doesn't make sense, but oh well. So, they talk a bit about the explosion earlier that day, and all the mess should be cleared and repaired by the morning. And Leiter admits that he enjoys working with Bond and that Washington doesn't think this is a weird plan at all. And he places himself under Bond's orders. But with Mati already there, he's afraid that he might not be able to do much, which is kind of true. Well, in the end, Leiter plays a pivotal part. That's true, that's true. Well, anyway, Bond tells Leiter all he knows about Le Chiffre, his gunmen, about Ms. Lind. And then Leiter tells Bond, a bit self-deprecatingly, that he was a regular in the U.S. Marine Corps. But Bond appreciates that. I like that. And you, it already tells you something about their professionalism and they're holding each other in high esteem. I like that. You can see the relationship starting to grow from here. Yeah, and is it here that Fleming says that Bond thinks that Americans are great people, especially when they're from Texas? Yes, yeah. he does. Leiter is apparently from Texas. He's about... 35 years old. He's tall with a thin bony frame 
and his movements and speech were slow, but you get the feeling that there's plenty of speed and strength in him. And he smokes even more than Bond does. Yeah, but I like that. I like that. And in the book, when especially if you have, if you have an audio book, you can hear the text draw. But he's very capable, and I have not seen that yet no. on screen. Mm, not yet. Maybe Jack. Maybe Ward? Rick Van Nutter. Maybe a bit. Oh, I think that's a terrible lighter. Yeah, you don't like that no, one? No, I don't like that one. I like Jack Lord, and I like Jeffrey Wright, and I also like David Hedison. But all the other ones are meh. Yeah. No, I think Rick Van Nutter, that's the guy who walks around in evening time wearing a pair of sunglasses. Okay, <laughs> apparently you can't do that. Well, apart from Fleming's uh, description of Leiter, one that I love is the recent comic book, Felix Leiter by Dynamite Comics. I uh, think that's a wonderful story. I don't know if you've read that. I haven't read it yet, but yesterday I saw a YouTube video on James Bond gifts for Christmas. I was a bit late, but <laughs> it was in my well, in my yeah. uh, in one of my lists, um, and it was on there as well. And I thought, well, that might be a That's nice an read. Excellent comic. It's it's really good if you uh, like Felix Leiter and his friendship with Bond. It's I can really really uh, recommend it. And yeah. I think it's one of the first examples of of really an expanded universe for the Bond franchise, isn't it? Yeah, it is, and it works as a as a standalone story. It works and and. Unfortunately, there's a huge cliffhanger at the end of the book, but I have not heard any word on a sequel yet for the comic. But okay. Yeah. Well, I might, I might oh, well. give that a read, uh, a read because I, I was intrigued by it when I when I saw it yesterday. Well, you should. Yeah, you should. I'm not really okay. a comic book guy, but yeah, who knows? It's James Bond, so. Uh, give it a go. Give it a go. So, here's part of an analysis again. So, let's see what you think about this. Just as the relationship between Bond and Matisse represents the alliance between Britain and France, the connection between Bond and Leiter is a bit symbolic of the affiliation between Britain and the US. And again, Bond is in the position of power. He's the leader of the operation and he tells everyone else what to do. And Leiter is in a supporting position. What does that tell you about how Fleming looked at the world? Well, he probably... Oh, you just disagree. <laughs> I, I kind of disagree. I think the United States really emerged from the Second World War as, as the real new superpower. But the US really needed Britain to start the CIA, which was basically set up by the British Secret mm. Service. All right. The US had no experience with all that covert stuff and spy stuff and the CIA. Well, they learned very quickly. I think they surpassed the Secret Service um, rather quickly as well. But I don't know what it was like in 53. No, me neither. But I, yeah. I do think that Fleming was pretty chauvinistic. I mean, it's yes, it's Britain all the way. And after that, we get France and America and all the rest. And you, you see that in, in From Russia with Love as well, when uh, when the Russians are, or the Soviets are, are discussing which uh, secret service to strike at. They're like, yeah, well, the Americans are, are clumsy. Oh, I love that part. Yeah, yeah that's they just a great throw part. money at it, uh, yeah. uh, and probably something <laughs> will stick somewhere along the way. And we have a, the Italians are okay, but the British, well, the British are. <laughs> oh, they are amazing, and really, really, yeah, they are. We're so jealous of them. So I, I, I do think that Fleming's opinion was slightly, well, Union Jack colored. Let's uh, let's let's it. call it that. Yeah. Okay, let's round out this um, chapter. At 7.30 p.m., uh, Leiter and Bond decide to stroll over to their hotel. But before leaving the casino, Bond deposits his total capital of 24 million francs. So that's about $600,000 or euros nowadays. And then as they walk to the Hotel Splendide, they notice a team of workmen already busy at the scene of the explosion. So Royal Azo is once again nice and orderly and peaceful that's very quickly yeah i love that yeah it's nice we yeah. don't want to we want, don't want to scare the tourists that just get everything back in, back in order as soon as possible and, and exactly. life goes on yeah well if, when they're back at the hotel they discuss the concierge of the hotel and they assume that if you didn't buy him then he's probably bought by le chiffre yeah all those tiny details i like that and they plan to meet at the casino at around 10 30 or 11 p.m the usual hour for the high tables to begin play. All right, that brings us to chapter eight, Pink Lights and Champagne. 
Bond gets ready for his dinner with Vesper, and we get a, a really nice paragraph about how he gets ready, straightening his tie, putting on his chamois leather holster, reading about the shirt he's wearing, his single-breasted dinner jacket. He makes sure that he have, has enough cigarettes to, to get him through the evening. He goes downstairs, and um, again, not much is happening in this entire chapter, but... That's what I wrote down. I wrote down, this chapter feels like a bit of padding. It's just filler. Yeah, but Basically, I it's Bond it. getting to know Miss Lind. Yeah. Oh, you it, really like it. And it works great. Yeah, it works great. They have a drink together before dinner. Mm -hmm. Vodka, of course. And Vesper tells him how she got her usual, unusual name. Uh, it was a storm. Now, I had to look it up. Did you know what it meant immediately? Vesper? It's a, it's a tornado or a... It's, no? No, it isn't. No. I had to look it up to make sure, but it means an evening prayer. Ah. And it's not explained in the book. Yeah. Vesper says, I was born in the evening on a very stormy evening, according to my parents. So they would pray, probably, to get through the storm. Right. They would say a Vesper, an evening prayer. Right. And yeah. I'd say that's a Vesper. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. Uh, well, of course, it, it's a play on words as well. Vesperlin, Vesperlin. It was the little in-joke that Fleming made. What was the joke? Vesperlin. Uh, and yeah. Sounds a lot like West Berlin. West Berlin, yeah. right. That's in there as well. And and 007 tells her about his newly invented cocktail. Yeah. Um, and asks Vesper whether he can call it a Vesper. And she's like, yeah, if I can try one and I like it, then you can use it. But we'll we'll have one after this uh, this mission is over. And we... Well, like you said, it might be a bit filler. We get some back and forth about champagne and about getting enough toast with your caviar. Oh, man, the ordering alone is like two pages of the chapter. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> and, and how being a bachelor makes you a bit pompous when it comes to food and drink. Yeah. It's just a cozy evening together and they get to know each other and they, they talk a bit about, yeah. well, about nothing at all. And um, I like the way how, how Bond is a bit ashamed of the way he's... Well, how pompous he is about his about his champagne and about his his caviar and his drinks and he's just well, I know that feeling when you're on a date and you well you, you notice that you're a bit of a it's it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, you don't really know each other and you want the other to like you. Yeah, you want so to come across as a bit knowledgeable, but you don't want to show off. So it's exactly. it's a very thin line that you're that you're walking, and and he, at least in his own eyes, he crosses that line here and there. Yeah, he, Fleming writes that Bond suggests to start with a glass of vodka while ordering dinner, and then Miss Lind gives an amused glance. Oh, you can have a cocktail, of course, if you want. Yeah. Or a cocktail. He corrects himself. Yeah. And then he feels nettles at the irony, the light shadow of a snub with which she had met his decisiveness, and at the way he rose to her quick glance. And that tiny paragraph, that's so recognizable for me. The way I'm always thinking about what would the other person think about me. Yeah. It's very exhausting, really. Mm. If you're constantly trying to read each other's thoughts and... It makes you afraid of saying anything, really. Yeah, self-criticism self is a bit of a bummer. <laughs> Once in a yeah. yeah. You must forgive me, he said. I take a ridiculous pleasure in what I eat and drink. It comes partly from being a bachelor, but mostly from a habit of taking a lot of trouble over details. It's very pernickety and old maidish, really. But then, when I'm working, I generally have to eat my meals alone, and it makes them more interesting when one takes trouble. Vesper smiled at him. I like it, she said. The chapter ends with, with Vesper starting her amazing story about the bombers and their, their camera cases. And that's actually a, a segue into, into the next chapter. But that's really the only thing that happens in this. But what I like about um, what you said at the beginning of this chapter, when Fleming describes what Bond is doing to get ready, what I like is that we find out what James Bond looks like because he looks in the mirror. Mm. Or he's already being described as Hoagie Carmichael by uh, Vesperlind. Something that he doesn't agree with. He doesn't agree, no. no. And when he looks in the mirror, he sees grey-blue eyes and a short lock of black hair, like a thick comma above his right eyebrow. Yeah. Now, that's something you read in almost every James Bond book, I think. And he has a thin vertical scar down his right cheek. Yeah. Fairly and Fleming piratical. describes it as fairly piratical. Now, Fleming loves a good pirate. 
<laughs> he, he thinks does. that pirates are something to romanticize and look up to. Yeah. Some someone that doesn't bend to authority or something. And that scar plays a very important role in in most novels. It's it's one of mm. his his signature traits. Mm. He disguises himself in in Live and Let Die. But he's being recognized because of the scar on his face. Hmm. But we don't see it in any of the movies. They never... Nope. Nope, 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 nope. Never use that. Well, you could call Piers Brosnan a method actor because he got a scar on his upper lip while filming I Believe Tomorrow Never Dies. Yeah, that's true. That's Uh, true. It isn't a two-inch scar, though. No. But, yeah... I yeah. don't think that's the first time that Pierce Brosnan has been called a method actor, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we'll give him that. But what I, I agree with you, this chapter really isn't about much. And at the same time, it's about so much Yeah, because of the pacing, because of they let the relationship grow and you can empathize with both of them. And you can already start their kind of difficult relationship that they will have after the events in the casino. It starts here. And you, he also brought two guns with him on this trip, right? Because he yeah. was sleeping with the with the point thirty eight police positive, and he yeah. also had and he has a point... twenty five Beretta. Yeah. yeah. So not only did he bring seventy packs of cigarettes for a couple of days, <laughs> he also brought two guns and maybe more. Yeah. So, yeah. well, he's well prepared. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, well, Vesper gets ready to explain the, the story of the, the, the bombers. Yeah, and then uh, we get to chapter nine. And that's the last chapter that we'll be discussing uh, uh, in this podcast. I think we've been talking quite a while already. Um, chapter nine is the game is Baccarat. Or Baccarat, or how do you say that? Let's go for Baccarat. Baccarat. This chapter basically lasts as long as their dinner. And Vesper starts by explaining what happened with the bombing of the Red Men and the Blue Men. I like that, that they are called Red Men and Blue Men. And the story itself, it's excellent. I mean, the, the police, they caught the third Bulgar and they extracted the story. Uh, and they were to get two million francs for killing Bond. And the agent who briefed them told them that there was absolutely no chance of being caught if they followed his instructions exactly. The agent gave them the two camera cases you saw. He said the bright colours would make it easier for them. He told them that the blue case contained a very powerful smoke bomb. The red case was the explosive. As one of them threw the red case, the other was to press a switch on the blue case and they would escape under cover of the smoke. In fact, the smoke bomb was a pure invention to make the Bulgars think they could get away. Both cases contained an identical high-explosive bomb. There was no difference between the blue and the red cases. The idea was to destroy you and the bomb throwers without trace. But the Bulgars had a different plan. They wanted to set off the smoke bomb first and then throw the actual explosive. When they pressed the lever down on what they thought was the smoke case, they blew themselves up. Lovely. This has nothing to do with the story, really. It's just an extra story, an extra anecdote. But I love these. They make the the complete books are rich and colorful, even though they don't have anything to do with the plot. And it shows how lucky Bond was. Again, yeah. it wasn't just a treat. It was also just the killers who showed a bit of initiative, which you should never <laughs> do as a henchman. <laughs> no, don't do that. No. <laughs> but do you know where this story came from? The, the, did it really happen? Or did Fleming invent it? Or was something that he experiences in himself during the war? I'm not sure. I never heard anything about it. So I think it was just something from his, his vivid imagination. Huh? Have you read Forever and a Day by uh, Anthony Horowitz? Uh, Yes, I have. He also has, somewhere in the middle of that book, he has like an anecdote that Bond is telling about a commander of a ship or something, or a Russian general, and it's called Russian Roulette, which was based on a brief outline Fleming originally wrote but never used. It was original Fleming material. Okay. And he uses that. He makes it a story that Bond tells to uh, 16. Okay. I can't remember. It's, I only read the book once. Um, that's okay. But it's it's almost the same thing. You know, like you have really? a story within a story that doesn't make any sense, really. But it's just nice. Yeah. It, again, it lets, the, bit... story, it lets the, the book breathe. Yeah. And I like the way Vesper tells the story. She's, she's almost in awe of the plan of the of the bad guy yeah it's a good plan yeah Yeah. and then vesper talks about how she got the job and she's very excited of working with a double o and this is very important because now bond starts to explain what actually means yeah the office was very jealous 
although they didn't know what the job was. All they knew was that I was to work with a double O. Of course, you're our heroes. I was enchanted. Bond frowned. It's not difficult to get a double O number if you're prepared to kill people, he said. That's all the meaning it has. It's nothing to be particularly proud of. I've got the corpses of a Japanese cipher expert in New York and a Norwegian double agent in Stockholm to thank for being a double O. So, what do you think of the, the double killing? It's, it's, it's only two or three lines. Yeah, it's That's very it. brief, and it, I like it that way. It gives it a bit of mystique, and it's just, this is in my past, I did this, it made me who I am, it made me the double O that you know, but he doesn't really elaborate on it. Very professional. He's not showing off, he's just, he gives her the bare minimum of facts, mm. and then he just goes on. Yeah. And just when Vesper is starting to enjoy dinner, and things are about to turn a bit more personal, Bond suddenly turns cold and harsh. Yeah. And he regrets opening up to, to her. He's very businesslike. Vesper feels deflated, even hurt by this. He gives her a taste she of was, her own medicine. Yeah. Does and she was warned that Bond was a dedicated yeah. man. I like yeah. that. Yeah, and then Bond goes on to explain the game of Baccarat, which was nice because I never knew how to play it, and it's nice that Bond has to explain to Vesper, so I, as a reader, also yeah. know how it works. We need that. It's kind of like uh, Mathis in the film. Yeah, Bond now has to go all in. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like that. <laughs> so Baccarat is played with uh, ten players. Le Chiffre will have about the same amount of money as Bond, which is about 24 million francs. If you want to play, you get two cards and you add those up. Court cards and tens count for nothing. Aces are only worth one point and, and the other card is its face value. And it's only the last figure of your count that signifies. So nine plus seven equals six, not 16. And the winner is the one whose count is nearest to nine. Just a little bit of trivia. Nowadays, Baccarat is played mostly for high stakes at, mm. uh, at casinos. And I believe I read somewhere that in Las Vegas, there are about 60 Baccarat tables that make about the same amount of money for the casinos as the 60,000 blackjack tables do. Wow. Because the high stakes players just gamble like crazy on that. And they, so they need, they, they only need about 60 tables to, to make a boatload of money there. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> well, there are plenty more rules to this game. Bond explains everything and Vesper really tries to listen attentively. And then the chapter ends by Bond summing up that he must beat Le Chiffre. And, and that's where we're going to end uh, the book for now. I mean, the game is about to begin. I want to go on. I want to, <laughs> I want to read yeah. on, but you know, we have to draw a line somewhere. Everything is set up. Uh, we have this very long build up towards what we're now going to get. So what we're going to get to uh, next time. But um, Have you ever played Baccarat yourself? Um, not the way Bond plays it. Uh, but in a casino you have played Baccarat. Yeah, but it's slightly different because the dealer plays for you. So you just, you either bet on the dealer or the player. But it's it's not the way, it, it's not played the way that, that we see in the Bond movies and in the... And in the novel, because that's usually just played for, for higher stakes. And I'm not playing for high stakes. <laughs> I'm just, uh... <laughs> but have you ever walked over to a Baccarat table and stood there yeah. in your dinner jacket and said, Banco? Um, no, but I have, oh! <laughs> I have watched it when I was in, uh, in Macau. <laughs> they were playing uh, at, the, at the casino we, where we were at. And they were playing for pretty high stakes. And I just watched... I was more than content with just watching. I've only played it with my uh, kids, uh, just for fun. Sweet. No stakes whatsoever. We just ideal everyone two cards. You can have one more card. And the, the trick is, um, do you take a card when you're at five or not? Yeah, that's and, the thing. But it's over in like five seconds. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's basically nothing more than betting on a coin flip. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, yeah. the only thing that the dealer has uh, going for him is it, that he can always act last. Yeah, he has slight, slightly more information than yeah. the other player. Yeah, It's a, a silly little game, but apparently Fleming loves it because he has Bond playing it 
many times. Yeah, it might yeah. be Bond's favorite game. I don't know, at least in the in the films. Okay, so here we will end the first part of our review of the book. Anything to add? Looking forward to part two. Yeah. We went through each chapter quite thoroughly, huh? We did. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. We also used quite a lot of resources, and uh, I will put those resources um, in the show notes so you can look at these at your leisure. Next time, we will continue our review of Casino Royale and we'll go through chapters 10 till 18. For any listeners out there, it might be fun for you to join us and read through those chapters yourselves. And also, as always, we'd love to hear from you, any thoughts or questions you might have. So to round off, please follow us on social media. Simply search for The Double O Files. Subscribe to our podcast in your favorite app and contact us at moneypenny at the double that is the zero zero files.com or visit us at www.thedoublefiles.com for in-depth articles, location videos, and more double O files. The double O files will return.